Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be going through elements, compounds and mixtures for your chemistry revision. Now there are lots of definitions, important definitions, that you need to get correct in this video. So over on the website we've got a set of flashcards which you can use to make sure you've got all your definitions correct and if this comes up in the exam you can write an exam perfect answer. So we're going to start by looking at the elements. An element is defined as a substance made of only one type of atom. This means that if we have a sample of an element, all the atoms in that sample will be identical. Each element is represented by its own unique symbol that is found on the periodic table. The periodic table is a comprehensive collection of all known elements each with their own unique symbol which comprises of either a single letter or two letters. Next, we're going to look at compounds and what compounds are and how we describe them. Compounds are defined as a substance that contains two or more elements chemically joined together. We know that elements contain only one type of atom, so compounds must contain two or more types of atom two or more elements chemically combined. They can't just be mixed together, they need to have undergone a chemical reaction. Another key feature of compounds is that they cannot be separated by physical processes. For example, they can't be separated by filtering, they can't be separated by boiling. They can only be separated by chemical processes, chemical reactions. Compounds are always formed by chemical reactions between different elements, two or more different elements chemically reacting to form a compound. So the properties of compounds then, the property of a compound after two or more elements have chemically reacted together, the chemical properties of that compound are likely to be very, very different to the properties of the elements that combine to form that compound. An example of this is water. Hydrogen and oxygen, which combine to form water, H2O, are both colourless gases at room temperature, whereas water is a liquid at room temperature. Therefore, the properties of water are very different to its component elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Some common examples of compounds include methane at the top there, which is one carbon with four hydrogens, carbon dioxide, which is one carbon with two oxygens, and water, which is one oxygen with two hydrogens. These all contain multiple elements that have chemically reacted together to form a compound. So we know that elements are represented by symbols that are seen on the periodic table. Well, the formula of a compound is comprised of the symbols of the elements with which it contains. The formula will also give information about how many atoms of each element is included in the compound. This is represented by a small number. This tells us how many atoms of each element are present in that compound, unless there's only one atom of that element, in which case it's just the symbol by itself. If we look at CH4 as an example, we can see that there is just one symbol by itself, C. That tells us that there's one carbon. And there is a H with a small four next to it. That tells us that there's four hydrogens. So in this compound, there's one carbon and four hydrogens. This compound with one carbon and four hydrogens is methane. So in order to write the formula for a compound, we need to know which elements are contained within that compound and how many atoms of each element there are. So now that we've covered elements and compounds, let's get into mixtures. Mixtures are substances that contain two or more elements or compounds that have been mixed together. They are not chemically combined. They have not undergone a chemical reaction and are simply mixed together. A key difference between mixtures and compounds is that in a mixture, each of the elements or compounds that have been added keep their own properties. They do not change properties like compounds do. 
mixtures can actually be separated back into the elements and compounds that form them. To do this, we need to use the appropriate physical method depending on what type of mixture we're working with. A great example of a mixture is air, the air that we breathe. Air is comprised of multiple different elements and compounds. Air contains nitrogen, which is an element, oxygen, which is also an element, water vapour, which is a compound, as we know, comprising of hydrogen and oxygen chemically joined together, and it also contains carbon dioxide, which is another element containing carbon and oxygen chemically joined together. If we take air as an example, nitrogen, oxygen, water and carbon dioxide have not chemically reacted with each other. They remain as separate entities within the mixture. This means that air can be separated back into examples of nitrogen, oxygen, water and carbon dioxide if we needed to. So following on from mixtures, we're going to look at the methods of separation. How do we separate these mixtures back into their individual parts? We're going to learn about five key methods of separation. Filtration, crystallization, distillation, fractional distillation, and finally, chromatography. You may be wondering why there's five different methods of separation. Well, the reason for this is that different types of mixtures containing different types of elements and compounds need specific separation methods. One of the key things to remember when we're talking about these separation methods is that these are physical methods. This means that there are no chemical reaction, chemical changes or new products being made at any time. All we're doing with a physical method of separation is separating out a mixture into its component parts, either component elements or compounds. The first method of separation we're going to look at in detail is filtration. Filtration is used to separate an insoluble solid from a liquid. So when we talk about an insoluble solid, we mean any solid that will not dissolve. So for example, this could be to separate sand from water or from any liquid. So let's look at this diagram more closely. In the beaker we have the solid and liquid mixture. This is the combination of the insoluble solid with the liquid. Filter paper. The filter paper allows the liquid to pass through but catches all of that insoluble solid to prevent it from moving through the funnel. The filter funnel has two functions. One, it allows us to pour our solid liquid mixture into the beaker without spilling or potentially spilling, acts as a housing for the filter paper to sit within. This allows the filter paper to filter out any of that insoluble solid while the liquid passes straight through the paper, through the funnel and into the beaker. Finally, we're left in the beaker with the filtrate. This is the liquid part that has passed through the filter paper, through the filter funnel and into the beaker. So filtration only works if we're working with an insoluble solid and liquid mixture. We need to make sure that we select the appropriate separation method for the type of mixture that we have. This would not work if the solid was soluble or could dissolve in the liquid. For example, sugar dissolved in water would not be suitable for filtration. Another method of separation is crystallization. Unlike filtration, crystallization is used to separate a dissolved solid or a soluble solid from a liquid. So thinking back to our previous examples that we used, this would be the appropriate separation method for dissolved sugar in water. As you can see, crystallization has a completely different setup to filtration, and this process relies on the evaporation of that liquid. As the liquid evaporates from the solution, the crystallised solid is left on the inside of the evaporating basin or crucible that's being used. Crystallisation requires a heat source. In the lab, this would be a Bunsen burner, but this also applies to any heat source. After most of the evaporation has occurred, we have to leave that solution then to evaporate fully. We normally leave this in a warm area or in a very low temperature oven. When you do this, 
Any remaining solid that is still dissolved in that small amount of solution will begin to crystallize slowly. And after a few hours or a few days, you'll be left with a sample of solid. So if we go back to our example of dissolved sugar in water, you would evaporate off the water with a heat source. You would then leave that to finish its evaporation and the crystallization process would happen very slowly until you were left with a pure sample of sugar. The next separating method is distillation. Distillation is used to separate a liquid and a soluble solid that are both within a solution. This is not like crystallization because in this method, we are collecting that liquid and not allowing it to evaporate off. So if we take a look at this diagram, we can already see some clear differences between distillation and crystallization. In distillation, this is a closed unit. There is no opportunity for that evaporated liquid to be lost. Similarly to crystallization, it requires a heat source, which in a lab would be a Bunsen burner. Attached on the side here, we have a condensing tube. A condensing tube surrounds another glass tube with cold water. It has an inflow and an outflow that is usually attached to a tap and a sink, and it circulates that cold water around the outside. Was any vapours to be condensed back into a liquid from a gas and then collected in the conical flask you can see in the diagram. The liquid that has been condensed and separated from the solution is then collected in a conical flask or beaker. The round bottom flask in this diagram contains the liquid and soluble solid solution, the mixture of those two parts together. Once all of the liquid has been evaporated, collected through the condensing tube and in the beaker, you'll be left with a sample of a solid in the round bottom flask and the collected liquid in the conical flask or beaker beneath the condensing tube. So in this method, you collect both parts of the mixture as opposed to crystallization, where you lose the liquid part as vapor and you only collect the pure solid. Another separation method that we need to know is fractional distillation. Fractional distillation is used to separate two or more liquids that are miscible with each other. Miscible means that these liquids mix well together. They are mixed together thoroughly and not separated with one sitting on top of another maybe. For fractional distillation to work, the miscible liquids that we're trying to separate must have different boiling points. The different boiling point is a key requirement for fractional distillation. This is how we separate these liquids. We increase to a temperature where one of them will boil and the other will not. Similarly to distillation, we have a condensing tube because we need to collect that liquid after it's evaporated. We need to condense it from a gas to a liquid. The next piece of equipment we need to look at is a fractionating column. A fractionating column is a tall tower that contains small obstacles, usually glass beads. As the mixture is heated, the liquid with the lower boiling point is going to vaporize first. It will begin to rise up the column and as it meets these beads, it will begin to condense. Once condensed, it will move back down the column and again be heated and evaporate again and rise up through. This allows only the liquid with the lower boiling point to be collected in the condensing tube and then in the beaker and leaves the other liquid that has the higher boiling point still in the round bottom flask. This method also requires a heat source, again, likely to be a Bunsen burner. Once fractional distillation is complete, you'll be left with a pure liquid in the conical flask or beaker beneath the condensing tube. Distillation is a separating method used to separate two very well mixed liquids from each other. The way for fractional distillation is that this all depends on the boiling points of the liquids involved. They must be different enough to allow one of them to evaporate and then be condensed and collected while the other stays inside the round bottom flask. The final separating method for us to look at is chromatography. Chromatography is a method of separation for substances with different solubilities. Solubility is how well something dissolves in a given solvent. Now, it's easy to say this is water, but solvents don't have to be water. They can be alcohols such as ethanol or other liquids. Chromatography uses these different solubilities in order to separate different components of a mixture. The most common use for chromatography 
is to look at the different pigments that are found within dyes, for clothes for example, or inks that we find in pens. Here we can see a diagram of chromatography set up, and the first thing to notice is the chromatography paper. This is a special kind of paper that allows pigments to move up with a liquid. The next thing to notice is we've got a line, a starting line, that must be drawn in pencil. The chromatography paper is sat within a beaker, and the very end of the chromatography paper is dipped within a solvent, sometimes water, sometimes alcohol. Finally, along that pencil starting line that we drew, we put dots of our dyes or inks that we're going to compare. As the solvent moves up the chromatography paper, once it reaches the samples, those samples will dissolve into the solvent and then be pulled up the chromatography paper. This pulling action of the movement of that solvent up the paper separates out the different pigments within the dyes or inks and allows us to compare them completely. Don't worry if chromatography seems complicated. You'll revisit this in much more detail later on in the course. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.